so welcome everyone to this meeting. It's uh, great you are here. Uh, we should continue with the third lecture on uh, the rigorous introduction to probability theory. And uh, the last time uh, we talked about fairly abstract things. We talked about uh, sigma fields and the Borel sigma field. Uh, close to the end of the lecture, uh, we got to defining uh, random variables. So random variables, obviously, are super important. So today uh, we should think a lot about random variables. Uh, I should clarify the concept and we should talk about fairly practical things like uh, cumulative distribution functions, probability mass functions, probability density functions, and so on. Uh, probably today we will talk more about the abstract things. So we will not do actual calculations, but uh, yeah, in the next lecture, uh, we should try to do some calculations, transform distributions, uh, define new random variables and uh, things like that. Um, yeah, today I would like to make sure that uh, for everyone, the fundamental concepts are clear. And yeah, the next week uh, we should be talking about uh, practicalities. How do you how do you do some probability calculations? So again, uh, th thanks for joining and uh, let's uh, jump to some quick recapitulation. So these are our notes. Uh, if you don't have a link to the notes, if you don't have a link to the quizzes, uh, again, you can use this link I have here to sign up. And that's also true if you are just watching the YouTube videos. And uh, yeah, what did we talk about the last time? Uh, we focused on this concept of the sigma field and then the Borel sigma field. Maybe really quick uh, recapitulation in here. Uh, when we define our events, uh, which are subsets of the sample space, uh, we would like to impose some condition on the set of events that we are willing to consider. So these will be events to which we want to assign probability. And uh, we imposed uh, these uh, three conditions in here, uh, specifically, um, yeah, we, we, we require that an empty set is a valid event. So this is going to be an event that will have zero probability. Uh, if you have an event A that uh, belongs to our set of events, which is required to be a sigma field, uh, then also the complement of it uh, must belong uh, to that sigma field, uh, to, the, to the sample space. And uh, if we have a finite or infinite sequence of events that do belong to our event space, then also their union has to belong there. So this was conditions imposed on the set of events. Uh, these conditions mean that the set of events is a sigma field. So if you have a set that satisfies these three properties, it is a sigma field. And for us, uh, it's something very practical. We want to be able to talk about the probability of nothing at all happening. Uh, if we assign probability to one event, we want to also be able to speak of the probability of the event not happening and uh, things like that. So yeah, this was uh, some discussion the last time. And uh, we also introduced this concept of the Borel sigma field. Uh, the Borel sigma field is important for thinking about continuous spaces. And uh, yeah, intuitively, the Borel sigma field was basically a set of uh, reasonable sets of uh, real numbers. So sets that have some nice properties. And the formal definition of the Borel sigma field was that the Borel sigma field is the smallest sigma field that contains all open subsets of the real line. Now, if you did the quizzes, then hopefully these concepts are clear to you. If you didn't do the quizzes, uh, please, please do that. Uh, it should definitely clarify your thinking about this concept. Um, and uh, yeah, so here are the important uh, properties of the 
uh, Borel sigma field um, are that, uh, uh, yeah, so, so the Borel sigma field definitely needs to contain all open subsets of the real line. Uh, it will definitely contain the real line itself. And it will also contain a lot of sets that are very useful, right? So the kind of sets that you want to think about, maybe one element set, two element set, an interval, open interval, closed interval, things like that. So when you start thinking about something practical uh, and you build some set to which you would like to assign a probability, uh, it will pretty much always belong to this Borel sigma field, which means you don't have to worry too much about this concept. Um, but we just need to have it there in the background so that everything is uh, well defined. And then, yeah, random variables. So this is something that we should discuss at depth right now. Uh, I started with the definition, but uh, I didn't have much time at the end. Oh yeah, so, so one question in the chat is uh, about the Borel set. Yeah, it's true that I did not mention a Borel set here. I, it, I did uh, include it in the notes after that, but uh, simply a Borel set, a Borel set, I have it here. Yeah, a Borel set is uh, a set of, a set that belongs to the Borel sigma field. So one of the reasonable sets, one of the reasonable subsets. Uh, of the real line. Uh, then, okay, let me, let me see. Yeah, ho hopefully I didn't miss uh, anything important in the chat right now. And uh, yeah, let's uh, jump to random variables. If people have questions about random variables, let me know, uh, but uh, yeah, what is this? Uh, in the first lecture, I said that uh, we would like to make this distinction uh, between the things that describe the randomness in our model and the things that are derived. Uh, so uh, the derived variables, the derived things, uh, these are the random variables. And these are functions. These are functions of... Um, of the, of the outcomes that belong to the sample space. I said that I would elaborate here on this technical definition of the random variable, and I should do that now. Well, let me think. Oh yeah, so, so maybe I, I should remind you here just uh, simply. If you have a sample space, it will contain some elements, uh, uh, the individual outcomes, and then we would define some function, in this case, a function x that would assign some real value to, to each of the outcomes. Um, and yeah, another uh, possible function that I mentioned the last time was just a quadratic function. Uh, we would have omega, the sample space, the whole real line, and the value of the random variable is going to be omega squared, where, where this little omega is uh, one of the outcomes. Uh, now, yeah, let's uh, unpack here a little bit the technical definition. Uh, so if we have, uh, yeah, if we have a probability space, so that will contain the sample space, uh, the, uh, the sigma field of events and the probability measure, then we can go ahead and define random variables. So specifically uh, here, we define random variable capital X, and it is a function of this kind. If you're not familiar with this type of mathematical notation, uh, what uh, this is saying is that uh, the function X is defined on our sample space. So it takes as arguments, the individual elements of the sample space, so the individual outcomes, and uh, the functional values are real numbers. So the output of the function uh, is a real number. And then we need to impose some technical condition in here to make sure that uh, everything is uh, well defined. Uh, specifically, we want to be able to assign the probability uh, to 
x belonging to some reasonable set, right? So x takes values in real numbers. Uh, so this capital B that we have in here, that's going to be some subset of the real line. You can imagine an interval of uh, some, some range of values. And then you would like to be able to assign probability to X belonging to that particular range. Uh, and uh, in order to be able to specify the probability, uh, we need to go back to the, to the sample space. We know, uh, need to go back to the probability measure. And for that reason, uh, we need to think about this set. So uh, this means we are thinking about all possible outcomes from the sample space, such that the functional value of X belongs to some specified range. And let's call that uh, capital A. So once you constructed this particular set, we require that this is a valid event. So it's a valid event that belongs to our um, uh, event space and it will have some valid probability assigned to it by the probability measure. Um, I have some illustration here. So, so let me go to some plots. Before that, uh, I will jump here to check the chat box. Uh, yeah, so a uh, question is the, Codomain limited to uh, real numbers only. Uh, can it be something else instead? So yeah, I think you're asking, uh, can the functional value of this X be something else than real numbers? And the answer is yes. So uh, even though I just call this random variable, you can have more general random variables. Here, we just have one real scale or random variable. You can definitely go ahead and define a random vector uh, or, you can think about complex numbers as well. You can have a random complex number uh, or a random variable that takes uh, complex values. It's uh, up to you, uh, but the, the definitions that you would use in that case are basically just uh, reflecting the kind of definition that we have here. It's uh, pretty easy to generalize uh, to include more components uh, of this variable X. So yeah, uh, thanks for that. Uh, and uh, we will definitely need those kind of things. Uh, if we want to think about multiple uh, random variables at the same time, and, and so on and so on. Um, and uh, a question, we are doing this because uh, we can define a probability measure on the whole sigma algebra. Uh, let me think. So uh, yeah, the point of constructing the, the event space so the sigma algebra, the sigma field, was that uh, we will be able to assign probabilities to the individual elements. So the elements of these, these are going to be valid events and they will have probability assigned to that. Uh, but uh, if we considered instead completely arbitrary subsets of the real line, then we would get into trouble. We would not be able to define probability measure uh, well enough. Uh, so, yeah, we, we are doing this uh, specifically to deal with the problem of continu con continuous spaces. And to avoid paradoxes, we just uh, deal with the sigma fields, with the elements of the sigma fields. And uh, we are not going to assign probability to anything that's outside of our event space, uh, our set of events. Okay, so uh, thanks for the question. And uh, yeah, I said, uh, I will have some pictures in here. So yeah, maybe this first one, this first example where we had one row of a die, uh, that was pretty clear. And uh, I don't think I need a picture, uh, but maybe one thing I should emphasize here. So if you think about the definition that we had, yeah, this is the sample space. These are the functional values of our random variable. And uh, what, what, is the, what is the B, right? So we, we talked about the set of B, the set of values, uh, set of values of X. So in this uh, little calculation that I had here, I was expressing the probability that X is greater than 0 0.3 for this particular random variable. 
So the B in that case is uh, simply the interval, uh, the open interval from 0 0.3 all the way to plus infinity. And uh, what would be the set A? It would be, uh, it would be this. Uh, it would be the outcomes for which the random variable belongs to that particular range. So uh, two, four, six in here. Uh, but uh, yeah, so for continuous uh, variables, uh, I have this illustration here. Uh, let me switch here. And I would like to make this dynamic. So this is an illustration of uh, a random variable uh, that would be corresponding to the if, uh, to the sample space being the real line. And uh, here I will be able to change the set B, right? So the set B, uh, this one, is some set to which the values of X can belong. And uh, I chose here an interval. It will be an interval from X1 uh, to X2. And then uh, we can ask, what is the set A? Uh, what is the set A? What is the set of possible outcomes uh, that uh, lead to X belonging to this range? And uh, the set A is in here. It's these blue intervals, this one and this one. And actually for clarity, I, I want to say here that uh, this is a picture of this particular random variable. So X of omega is omega squared. Uh, so on the horizontal axis, uh, we have the individual outcomes. On the vertical axis, uh, we have the functional values of X. So kind of the realized values of that uh, random variable. And uh, yeah, these are definitely linked. So uh, this is uh, dynamic. I can change X1 and uh, you see how the uh, set capital A uh, changes in here, right? So if we increase the range of X's, then also uh, the set of omegas, uh, the corresponding set of omegas is going to grow. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so hopefully you, you understand how this figure functions. And the point is that uh, we would like uh, for any reasonable set, capital B uh, can be an interval, can be some more general element of the Borel sigma field. Uh, we would like to be able to define the probability that X belongs there, right? Uh, we, when we just write down the form of the random variable, uh, we don't know yet the probabilities, but uh, we want to be able to say, what's the chance that X falls into this uh, set capital B, the borrow set B. And uh, that involves looking up all of the possible outcomes, uh, like here and here, that are consistent with X belonging to B. And once we have that, or once we have this set capital A, uh, then we can simply say what the probability is. It is the probability measure of this particular set. Um, now, I, I know this confuses people uh, quite often, but uh, does, does anyone have a question in here? Uh, that is, uh, we used a lot of terms that sound similar. I would like to disentangle here uh, the, the distinctions between the different concepts. So, so any questions right now? So long story short, we want to be able to say, what's the chance that X belongs to B? where B is some Borel set, some reasonable subset of the real line. And uh, in order to be able to do that, we need to require that also the set A is valid. So in this case, A needs to be a valid event uh, from our probability space. Uh, all right, so usually we actually have a lot of discussion about that when I try to explain it, but uh, is everyone okay? No, no questions? Now, uh, then we should be able to go ahead if this is clear. So let's move to something that's very practical. 
we should start talking about distributions, uh, distributions of random variables. And uh, yeah, there are some terminological subtleties. So I will, I will try to explain this. Uh, hopefully I will not confuse people. So technically, uh, technically the distribution of a random variable is the specification of the probabilities uh, that the random variable belongs to some sets, to some ranges, maybe intervals. And uh, yeah, so if we have a distribution, we can denote it uh, Px. So that will be the distribution of random variable x. And this will be a function that takes as argument some reasonable sets B. So here it means elements of the Borel sigma field. And assign, it assigns probability to them. So the distribution is the function that takes B as argument and produces the probability. And the B in here can be something like what we have here. Uh, now, I, I will uh, sh show you kind of the mathematical expressions. But before I get there, I also want to warn you. So when people say distribution, they can mean all sorts of things. And yeah, I guess I also don't always make this uh, terminological distinction very clear. Uh, but uh, yeah, so a distribution, strictly speaking, is uh, this function that takes as arguments the regions to which x can belong. Uh, but uh, informally, uh, when people say distribution, they can mean something else, something else that uniquely determines the distribution. So they can mean a probability mass function, they can mean a probability density function, uh, they can mean the cumulative distribution function. So concepts that we will talk about uh, in, in a couple of minutes. So I, I just want to warn you. So uh, technically a distribution is this Px, but uh, in common language, people can mean some other mathematical objects. Uh, so yeah, I said uh, the distribution will be a function that tells you the probability. So if you have argument B, it will be the probability of X belonging to B. And uh, yeah, how, how do we specify the probability? It, we specify it using the mechanism that I just explained. So we are going to use the uh, probability measure and uh, we are going to look up the probability measure of the set of omegas such that X belongs to B. I'm using a little bit different notation, but uh, yeah, we, here we had the set capital A. So that's what I mean by X inverse B. I have some comments here on the terminology or like the mathematical notation. So I will comment on this a little bit more, but uh, if you don't particularly like this expression, X inverse B, don't worry. Uh, you can just imagine capital A, it's supposed to mean the same thing. So the capital A that we had, that's the argument of the probability measure. And that tells us the probability that X belongs to some region capital B, which can be an interval, for example. And uh, I'm getting questions. Uh, so one question, is this the pre-image? And indeed, so that's the pre-image. Uh, right, right, right. Yeah, so you're anticipating this correctly. I have some more discussion. If this discussion confuses you, don't, don't worry. Uh, it's uh, just an explanation of the set capital A. And uh, yeah, before I get to the pre-image, let me also re read this one. Uh, let's say we have a reasonable capital B. Uh, can it be that for some X, the pre-image of X is not a reasonable, uh, not in a sigma field? And it is possible. So it is possible to come up with a function such that the capital B is reasonable, but capital A is not. But if you have such function, you will not call it random variable. If you want to call it random variable, it has to have this property. If capital B is reasonable, capital A also needs to be reasonable. 
And uh, yeah, for those uh, who like this mathematical terminology of pre-image, I have some, some notes in here. So what is uh, X inverse B? It is this simply a set of omegas such that X belongs to B. And also let me warn you, so this uh, X inverse B notation does not assume that the function X is invertible. Uh, the capital X can be a function that cannot be inverted. So this is not an inverse function. This is actually the pre-image of the capital B. So whatever we called capital A. Uh, so you were right about the terminology and Oh yeah, I also have this uh, here in some mathematical equation. So that corresponds to the picture that I just showed you. On the dynamic picture, we have a quadratic random variable. Uh, if the set uh, capital B is an interval from four to nine, then capital A, the pre-image of B, is this union of intervals from minus three to minus two and from two to three. Um, so, yeah, so hopefully this is clear. Let me see. And a question by reasonable set, uh, we mean measurable sets. So if we are talking about a set of possible values of capital X uh, by a reasonable, uh, I mean belonging to the Borel sigma field. So if you want to think about, say, the Lebesgue measure, uh, then yes, uh, it will be a measurable set. And by reasonable for the capital A, I mean that it's an event, a valid event to which we assign some probability measure. Okay, yeah, so, so thanks for the question. I, I know this confuses people a lot. So uh, any more questions right now uh, before we get to the practical things like CDFs, PDFs, and so on? Okay, so I'm going to assume this is clear. If people have questions later on, uh, let me know. Oh yeah, I think I should recapitulate this here. Um, so uh, what did we have? So we had uh, some sets capital A uh, to which some outcome omega may belong. So these were the events. Then we have the probability measure of that event that would be the probability of capital A. Uh, when we say that A is reasonable, uh, we belong that it uh, belongs to the sigma field of events. Uh, then we have B, that's a set to which uh, the values of X can belong. And then we will have the probability for that. So that's the distribution of X applied uh, to this set capital B. Uh, and uh, the capital B needs to be reasonable. It needs to belong to the Borel sigma field. And finally, uh, we have a connection between the probability measures and the distributions. And the connection is this one. Uh, the probability, so, so the distribution applied to the set B is equal uh, to the probability measure of the pre-image of B. Yeah, did I explain this okay? Uh, do people have questions? Now, why are we spending so much time with this? It is to formally define all of the different uh, things that we want to talk about. It's a little bit slow, right? Uh, it, it requires some effort. But the payoff is that uh, when we look at mathematical theorems, uh, it will not be cumbersome. We will be able to uh, say very quickly, uh, what are the, the ideas in the theorem if we have all of these things properly defined. Uh, uh, yeah, so I talked about the distribution and now let's talk about the cumulative distribution function. So this is uh, kind of the first practical concept, I would say, uh, when it comes to uh, distributions you may want to use for calculations. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm getting question uh, a bit confused here. Uh, is it necessary to define things in terms of uh, pre-image? 
So we do need the pre-image in order to be able to say, what's the chance that X belongs to some range? Um, so, oh yeah, maybe I should uh, provide here some intuitive uh, context. Uh, let's say that you have some probability model. Uh, it will be uh, some meteorological model for the entire planet, okay? So it will have a lot of variables and uh, yeah, atmospheric pressure, uh, temperature, humidity, things like that. So a lot of different variables. So that's something that we can capture by omega, if you like. Omega, those will be the outcomes. And then you can ask, uh, what, is, um, what is the temperature in Tokyo? Or what's the average temperature in uh, Tokyo, Kyoto, and Osaka, or something like that. So these will be uh, random variables. And then if you want to assign probability to this, you kind of need to go back to the sample space in order to look up the probability of the corresponding omegas. So if you are dealing with the average temperature in Tokyo, Kyoto, and Osaka, uh, this will be some function of omega of the state of the atmosphere. And you need to find out what is the probability of omegas that are consistent with the temperature, this average temperature uh, being in some interval that you like, maybe between 21 and 22 degrees centigrade, something like that. So we do need the pre-image. Uh, the pre-image means that uh, we go from the values of the random variables and we look up the probabilities of the outcomes associated with that. So uh, thanks for the question. Hopefully I explained this okay. And another question, I think it's uh, because random variable may not be injective. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, in, in detail, we want all of the omegas such that X belongs to our set B. Uh, now, finally, uh, let's get to something practical. So cumulative distribution function, definitely is something that everyone needs to understand. Even if you are not thinking every day about the Borel sigma field, you do need to think about CDFs. So what is this going to be? Uh, it's going to be a function and the function is going to be defined using the distribution function or yeah, the, the distrib yeah, you, you, sorry, using the distribution of X. Uh, we said that distribution of X takes as argument sets. So sets of possible values of X. And here we are very specific. We are asking what is the probability uh, that uh, capital X is somewhere between minus infinity and some specified value, a uh, little x. So what's the chance uh, that capital X falls in this interval? And importantly, the interval in here includes the, 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 the boundary value, a uh, little x. So what we have on the right-hand side is going to depend on the value of little x. And uh, that allows us to define this function. So the CDF, the cumulative distribution function of capital X evaluated at little x is simply the distribution of capital X evaluated at this interval. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can also write it this way. Uh, F of uh, little x is going to be this probability that capital X is less or equal uh, to little x. Uh, I should show, show some pictures in here. Um, but uh, yeah, before I get to the pictures, any, any questions? So what would be examples? Uh, we can think about, uh, say, the Bernoulli distribution. I have the CDF of the Bernoulli distribution plotted here. Uh, that's the blue. And if you are asking about the probabilities, um, the, the Bernoulli pro uh, distribution is a very simple one. Uh, the probability of value zero is one minus little p, and the probability of one is little p, and this little p is somewhere between zero and one. Um, yeah, uh, the, the blue, the blue uh, 
lines here indicate the CDF. And um, yeah, if you are, say, at value minus one, the value of the CDF here is equal to zero simply because the Bernoulli distribution never produces a value that's negative. So we have a CDF that's constant at zero here. Uh, if we evaluate the CDF at zero, literally, uh, what we obtain is uh, one minus P. So that's why you have a jump in here. So you, you jump to this place. And then again, the CDF is constant until you reach value of one. There's uh, one more jump uh, to this value. We reach uh, the functional value of one and we stay at one forever. But the blue, uh, uh, the blue uh, set in here indicates the graph, the, the, the plot of the CDF of the Bernoulli distribution. And as for the red dots, uh, these simply indicate these uh, values. Uh, one minus P, uh, so one minus P is here. It's the height of this uh, red point and P is here. That's the height of this point. So uh, some, some simple, simple example of CDF, uh, any questions? I have a couple more examples. Uh, if you have bi binomial distribution, uh, the CDF and the PDF uh, would look like this. And the sizes of the jumps of the CDFs, uh, they correspond precisely uh, to the probabilities of these individual values of uh, capital X. So again, uh, the probabilities are the red dots and the CDF, that's the blue graph. So these two distributions that I talked about, uh, there the random variables can only take a finite set of values, but you can also think about a random variable uh, that will have an infinite uh, number of possible values. So that would be the Poisson distribution. I wrote the probabilities in here. Um, so that's the formula for the probabilities. And uh, for the Poisson distribution, uh, you can get any non-negative an integer as, uh, the, as the functional value. And that's the CDF of it and uh, the individual probabilities. Now, I definitely want to connect this also to probability mass functions and uh, probability density functions. But uh, yeah, any, any questions at this moment? So again, the CDF in indicates the probability that capital X will be below some specified value or equal to it. I also want to quickly mention here important properties. So, so the CDF is definitely uh, non-decreasing. If you increase little x, then you can only increase the probability because you are uh, making the range larger. The CDF will have these jumps. If you have specific values of capital X uh, where the probability is finite, so non-zero. And uh, these CDFs are always uh, right continuous. I'm not going to hear, go here through the technical definition, uh, but uh, right continuous simply means that if you go here from the right and you ask for the limiting value, uh, then the limiting value is going to be equal to the functional value of that CDF. So every CDF is going to satisfy these three properties. Okay, let, let me see, uh, questions. Uh, um, jumps if uh, the variable X is discrete. Uh, yeah, so if we have discretely distributed random variable, uh, then at the places where we have this finite probability, uh, we will have the jumps. So that, that's exactly right. So you see, if you look here, the jumps in the CDF are exactly at the support of the distribution at the places where we have some positive probability. So that's the CDF. And yeah, when people first uh, learn about probability, 
they typically don't start with uh, CDFs. Uh, they start with, uh, say, these probably the mass functions or probably the density functions. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's actually easier if, if we sort of start from CDFs. As for probably the mass functions, that's uh, pretty intuitive. Oh, sorry. I think uh, I will need to make some comments here about different types of random variables before I even go to these probability mass functions and density functions. So uh, yeah, this is just uh, for you to get some big picture of what the distinctions are. Uh, we can have discrete random variables. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, we can have discrete random variables and a random variable capital X is discrete if it takes values only in some countable subset of the real line. Now, what does countable mean? A countable set is either a finite set or a set whose elements you can order nicely into some sequence. So if you have a sequence of values uh, and um, yeah, so if you can take the possible values of capital X and you can organize them into either a finite set or sequence, then we say the random variable is discrete. And this will have probability mass functions. Uh, then we will also have continuous random variables. And uh, the continuous random variables, uh, these are going to be those whose uh, CDF, uh, cumulative distribution functions can be written as an integral of the so-called probability density functions. So yeah, uh, discrete random variables, they have the probability mass function, continuous random variables, they will have probability density functions. Uh, but now there's actually one more thing uh, that's possible. The so-called uh, singular uh, random variables. And I don't think you need them for practical calculations. Uh, so you don't even have to think about these, but yeah, th those of you who are interested in all of the mathematical possibilities, uh, yes, there is uh, one more possible type. But we can ignore that type for our practical calculations. And uh, yeah, we can think not just about the discrete random variables, but continuous random variables, and we can take mixtures. So that's something that I emphasized in the very first lecture, right? Uh, I said, uh, we may want to think about mixtures of discrete and continuous random variables. And uh, this whole framework allows us to do things uh, in some elegant way. Uh, so that's uh, about the types. And uh, now I would like to say a little bit about uh, probability mass functions and probability density functions. I I'm not sure how far I will be able to get with probability density functions. I'm going a little bit uh, more slowly than I thought. Uh, but yeah, if we don't have much time for the PDFs, uh, we can definitely discuss it the next time. And yeah, also the next time we should talk about the transformations of random variables, which is something that everybody needs to know. So as for probability mass functions, it's pretty simple. Uh, if you have a discrete random variable, uh, then the probability mass function is simply the specification of the probabilities of these individual values of X. And uh, I have the exact same examples here. So for example, the Poisson distribution that looks like this, uh, the, for it, the CDF is the blue graph here and the, the, the PDF, sorry, the PMF, or the probability mass functions, that's indicated here using the red dots. And uh, really what we are plotting here is uh, these values. Um, so I'm not going to elaborate much on this specific function in here, uh, but uh, yeah, um, I just wanted to say here, if you have a discrete random variable, even if it takes infinitely many possible values, uh, you will have this probability mass function. Uh, any, any questions at this moment? And then, yeah, let's get to probability density functions. 
I will probably need to elaborate on it the next time, but uh, uh, yeah. A simple case uh, to think about uh, regarding probably the density functions would be the case where the CDF is differentiable. So it has uh, derivatives everywhere. And uh, at this moment, uh, I need to assume that you are familiar with calculus, that you are familiar with uh, derivatives and integrals and things like that. Uh, if you are not, then maybe we can have some other lectures when, when, where I would also introduce these uh, fundamental mathematical concepts related to calculus. But for now, uh, I'm, I'm just going to assume that everyone knows uh, what the derivatives are and has some notion of uh, what integrals can mean. And uh, yeah, so if we have a CDF that's differentiable, so we can calculate the derivative everywhere, then the concept of the probability density function is pretty simple. It's just the derivative of it. So you can write the derivative using a prime. You can write the derivative in this way. So uh, examples. Uh, let's uh, think about the normal distribution. So the normal distribution uh, would have a cumulative distribution function like this. Uh, so that's the blue curve here. And uh, then the other one, the, the beige curve, that's the probability density function. And you notice uh, that uh, the probability density function, uh, this one, is large at those places where the CDF has a large slope. And uh, if the PDF is very small, the CDF is kind of flat. So the PDF is simply the derivative uh, of the CDF. And um, the intuitive, uh, the intuitive uh, interpretation of the PDF is how likely the specific values of x are in here. So you can imagine having some small interval of x's. And then you would ask, what's the chance that uh, capital X falls to that small interval? It will be roughly the value of the PDF times the size of the interval of X's that you consider. So that's the probability density function. And uh, uh, yeah, you can have also uh, say the log normal distribution. It would have a CDF and PDF with this shape. And uh, again, uh, the derivative of the CDF is the PDF. And you can think of the PDF as expressing the chance uh, that the, val the, value, uh, the value of x is in some small range of x's in there. So maybe I'm saying it in a complicated way, but all I mean is that the values of x in here are pretty likely. The values of x in here are quite unlikely. And here we have the PDF at zero. So the value of X in here has zero probability. Um, now, uh, this was in the case where the derivative exists everywhere. Uh, there's a more general case. Uh, it looks like I will have to leave it for the next time. But uh, yeah, it, it can be that your CDF is uh, not differentiable. And in that case, the, um, yeah, you, you need to define the probability density function in a slightly more general way. So yeah, we will talk, uh, talk about that the next time. Uh, I guess uh, we should also next time talk about the CDF and PDF of this Pareto distribution. So in here, the blue curve, uh, I guess it's uh, covered by the beige curve here. But uh, you will not have a derivative of this function um, when x is equal to one. So to handle these kind of things, uh, we will have some more general definition of the PDF. And obviously, uh, this, this will be something very, uh, very practical. Um, all right. Uh, so 
uh, long story short, uh, using the uh, yeah, using the concept of the distribution, uh, we can define the cumulative distribution function. Uh, for discrete random variables, we define PMF. For continuous random variables, we define PDF. And I will have to elaborate on that definition. We can think about uh, also uh, distributions that are mixed. So mixtures of uh, continuous and discrete uh, distributions. And uh, yeah, the next time uh, we should talk about how you do some practical calculations, how, how you transform all of these. And uh, when people see this for the first time, uh, they get actually pretty confused. So if you define one random variable using another one, how exactly do you need to transform the probability density functions and stuff like that? And the calculations of that type, they show up basically everywhere in the literature that's somehow related to statistics. So you will see it in a lot of scientific papers uh, in many quantitative fields. Um, and I know that uh, many people are not so comfortable with these transformations. So we should uh, spend some time on it the next time uh, to really finish covering these uh, elementary concepts uh, from probability theory. And for sure, the type of calculations that we will have the next time, they are things that you need to uh, do in your everyday work if you are doing something related to statistics. Uh, thanks a lot for joining, and uh, I will see you next time.